Hi there. Have you ever watched a movie or played a game that immersed you into a fantastical world? And have you ever wanted to make those kinds of worlds on your own? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you an amazing way of creating such worlds using a handcrafted free kit from Kitbash 3D and Blender, a free 3D art software. To actually get started, we are going to download the kit we will be using. I'm on kitbash3d.com. Kitbash has created some of the world's most versatile premium 3D asset libraries. These kits have been used across the industry. They have loads of awesome kits to explore different themes like Viking villages, mega cities, fallen battlefields, pirate coves, and so much more. But for the purpose of this tutorial, we are going to be using this kit, Mission to Minerva. This kit is free and looks exciting. Kitbash supports lots of different software, but since we're going to be using Blender, we select that one and hit download. Then we get the kit and it's ready to open in Blender. When you open the kit, you will have to reattach all the texture files, which is fine because it's super simple. We just head to File, External Data and hit Find Missing Files. Then we locate the texture folder, in our case 2K is just fine, and hit Find Missing Files. Now we can check out all the assets with textures in the Material Preview. This kit is great if you want to create advanced settlements in a distant galaxy on a foreign world. This kit is packed with everything from research facilities and refineries to landing base and dropships. I might do something with those dropships. Always good to have something flying in the image. It makes everything a bit more dynamic. What's also cool is that every kit bash kit has a mix of hero buildings and smaller props, which is great when we have to actually flesh out our world. And if you're new to Blender, then let me guide you through the basics of the UI and navigation. It's not very complicated and there's lots of resources to expand your knowledge online. To get started with the basics, let's get a clean scene. Luckily, the kitbash file already has one ready for us. So we jump to the top here and select the scene called scene. This scene is a basic Blender setup with a cube, a lamp and a camera. So firstly, a little bit about the UI of Blender. The big section in the middle here is the viewport. This is where all the 3D scene building and modeling takes place. Over here on the right, we have the outliner. The outliner is a hierarchy of all the assets in our scene. Down here, we have the properties panel that has all the information about our objects and our scene. Everything above this little gap are scene properties and everything below are local object properties, like the location, rotation and scale of our object. So to actually navigate the 3D viewport, we will start off with the middle mouse button. Holding it down and moving your mouse rotates the scene. If you then hold shift and the middle mouse button, the view starts panning instead. If you hold down control and the middle mouse button, you dolly zoom in and out. And if you simply scroll on the middle mouse button, you step zoom in and out. Pretty simple. To select objects in your scene, you simply left click them. And to deselect them, you just click into empty space. And you can also box select items by holding down left click while dragging over the objects. To move our objects in 3D space, we work with location, rotation, and scale, which we can see over here in the properties panel. If you start changing these values by clicking and dragging, you can see the cube move, rotate, and scale. But we can also move the objects using hotkeys. The best way to do this in Blender is to select the object and hitting G for grab. Now the object follows the mouse as you move it around. And if you click again, you now confirm that movement. But we can also use hotkeys to get more control. Let's select the cube again, hit G, and then press X. Now the cube moves only along the X axis. Neat. We could now also press Y to change it to the Y axis instead, or set for the set axis. And then once you're happy with your move, you just click to confirm. This also works for rotation and scale. Click R for rotate, and now the cube starts spinning when moving the mouse around. And then again, we can hit X, Y, and Z to switch between the different axes of rotation. And the story is the same for scale. Just hit S for scale, and now you can start scaling. Neat how that all works out. And it has the same control with the axes. If you potentially would like to add a new object to your scene, you can come up here to the Add menu, then under Mesh, we see a bunch of primitives, cubes, planes, etc. But if we go out and then hover over the add menu button, we get a shortcut hint, shift A. In Blender, this means that the shortcut for this menu is shift A. Let's try it out. We press shift A and yeah, we get that same menu. And we could use that to create something like a plane. And by the way, this is how shortcuts are found throughout Blender. Okay, I think 
we got the basics down, let's start building our scene using our awesome assets from Kitbash. Let's use the Shift A menu to create a new plane. And I want to use this plane to build out a whole terrain. This kit comes with a couple of nice textures to help us make a terrain for our Minerva scene. So I'm going to scale up this plane a bit, then head over to the Material tab, click this drop down, and search terrain underscore C. To actually see your material, we can go up to the Material Preview tab here and switch over to that one, which is this black rock material. This material will be super awesome as the base for everything that we're making. But we got one problem. It's completely flat. But Kitbash actually comes with a displacement map, so we can use that to get some height. Firstly, we will have to give our plane some more resolution. We can do this by selecting our plane and heading over to the Modifiers tab. Here we will create a subdivision modifier, set it to simple and set it to the max, which is 6. Then I will go up here and hit Apply. Now if we switch to the wireframe view, hitting set and dragging to the left, we can see all the topology. But we need a bit more resolution. So let's hit set again and drag down to enter material preview. Then let's create another subdivision modifier, just set it to 2 this time and hit apply. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Okay, now we can actually displace the mesh. So let's create another modifier called a displace modifier. On its own, it doesn't do much because we need to give it a texture. So I'm going to hit new texture and call it terrain underscore C to match our black rock texture. Then I will go down to the texture properties panel. And in here, I will go to this little drop down, which looks through all the texture files in the scene. Here, I will search for terrain underscore C and choose the one called height. Now we're getting somewhere. This is much better. It's a bit too strong, so we just head back to the Displace modifier and lower the strength. Boom. Okay, I'm pretty happy with this. I'm just going to duplicate this and change out the file with Terrain B, the green stuff, and Terrain A, the white stuff. I'm planning on building some kind of mining facility, and I imagine the black rock to be the core bedrock, and then the green rock to be the crystal-like structures they're mining. Now I can duplicate my dark rock and start moving it around. But to get a bit more variation, I want to modify the plane itself. So I will go ahead and apply the displacement modifier on this plane. And now by clicking tab with the plane selected, I can enter edit mode. Edit mode is the place where you can actually edit the vertices, edges and faces of a mesh. Well, what I want to do is very simple. I want to turn on soft selection by pressing O, select a point of the mesh, scaling up the radius by scrolling the mouse wheel. And now I can press G to grab it and move it along an axis, just like we did with the objects. This is a super fast way to give us a lot of variation to play with. With this simple soft selection technique and just moving stuff around, I can iterate my scene really fast. I did exactly the same process for the green stuff to form it into crystal-like rifts in the rocks. Cool, I'm more or less done with the environment for now. Let's start populating the scene with some assets from the kit. I've been eyeing out this terraformer right here. It looks quite striking and I think it would be really great for my scene. So we could just copy the asset into the other scene, but that would get very heavy quickly. So instead, I'm going to create instances for some of this stuff. It's super simple and it also helps organize your scene. So all the kit assets have this little transform below. This is where everything is parented to. By selecting it and heading over to the outliner, we can right click it and choose select hierarchy. This selects everything that is a child of this transform. Then we can press M to make a new collection, basically a group for stuff. And by right clicking on this collection and hitting instance to scene, we then get a copy of the stuff in our scene, but this copy is super fast and performant. So then we can simply copy on control C, head over to the other scene and paste with control V. And now we got our generator in our new terrain. Awesome. And then we could just do that with all the other stuff we also need. I'm just starting with the big pieces from the kit to plan out the area, and then I'm going to fill out the details later. I think this is the time where you can really experiment with what you're trying to make. In many ways, I see this process more like playing than anything else. And because the kits are so detailed, they help kickstart the imagination. I'm thinking for me, I want some kind of circular base with a centerpiece in the middle. And I think this tower structure can be the focal point. 
And then now my job is just to play smaller structures around to bring in some noise and really emphasize the terraformer in the middle. To make your environment stand out, it's generally good to have a sense of contrast. Having something big and impressive surrounded by smaller structures really makes it stand out from everything else. I definitely think this part is the most fun and you can really just try out a bunch of different stuff. In general, I try to keep everything in a somewhat similar scale. By this, I mean that I always imagine people walking around in the space. I make sure they can get to where they need to go and so on. So if they need walk bridges, special buildings or vehicles, I can place them in a way that fits my idea. I think a good strategy for making your environment is making it almost like a level in a game, a place where you could walk around. Then when we have that down, we can start filming it like a photographer. Go explore and find a good shot in our settlement. I think a really awesome part of this kit is its modularity. Kitbash has packed a bunch of settlement pieces in it, and you can essentially combine them to create even more elaborate structures. Okay, so to give our scene some life, I think it's time to start adding some lighting. The best way to get a lot of fidelity in lighting is through using an HDRI. HDRIs are high resolution environment maps that can really light up our scene like nothing else. They're usually captured from the real world and they can really give some realistic illumination to our scene. To get free HDRIs, I recommend going over to Polyhaven. They have tons of awesome ones to pick from. And I think I'm gonna get uh, this one and then hit download. Then in Blender, I'm gonna jump over to the shading workspace. Here we have this new window with materials and then I'm gonna switch it over from object to world. Then inside the window, I'm gonna hit shift A and search for an environment texture node and plug it into the background shader. Then I'm gonna hit open and locate my HDRI that I downloaded before. And then I'm gonna switch over to the rendered view right up here. Also in Blender, when you wanna render more realistic scenes, you probably wanna be using cycles. So let's go over to the render panel and switch over to using cycles as our render engine instead. And make sure to select GPU compute if you have a good GPU. If that option isn't available, just check your Blender preferences under system. Now everything starts looking really interesting. The light just falls onto the scene in a totally different way. The assets start looking real, like you could actually grab them. Okay, to get some variation on our HDRI, it would be great if we had the ability to rotate it. So once again, let's hit Shift A and search for a texture coordinate node. Okay, we got that one. Then let's hit Shift A again and search for a mapping node. Then we plug the texture coordinate into the mapping nodes vector and then the mapping node into the vector of the environment texture node. Now, by going to the set rotation on the mapping node, we can make the HDRI spin around. This is super awesome for quickly testing out different lighting for your shot just by using one HDRI. And you could always try other ones as well. If you want even more control, then a great thing to do is getting a light source, specifically a sunlight. So in our scene, we can hit Shift A and select a sunlight. This will cast lots of light on our scene from one direction. And by rotating it around, we get so much control over the shadows and the look of our scene. 90% of the time, my lighting is just a sunlight and an HDRI. The HDRI fills up the color and the shadows, and the sunlight is, well, you know, the sun. You can also change the color of the sun by heading over to its light properties panel, go to the color and just pick you know, something. For myself, I'm looking for something in the afternoon. So my color is gonna be a bit warmer, like, you know, an orange. This is one of the best parts of the process. Seeing the scene come together and then lighting it all up is just so rewarding. Okay, we have managed to bring some light into our scene, but I think it's time to get an angle, a camera to shoot from. So I will jump back to the normal viewport shading and then once again, we'll use our trusty Shift A menu, but this time we're gonna create a camera. To actually see through the selected camera, you can hit Control plus Numpad zero. And now we're looking through the camera and then you can start rotating the camera using your hotkeys and so on to get a different view. But there's a much better way. If you press N, this little panel called the N panel opens up and over here, there's a setting called Lock Camera to View. When this is enabled, you can control the camera as if though you were navigating in the scene like normal. Neat! 
Now we just gotta find a cool angle. This is kind of like traveling through a world of your own making, which is kind of fun. I'm definitely getting that explorer's vibe now, which is awesome. And when you find a good spot, you can just jump over to the render view again to see it. If it doesn't look quite right, then you might have to adjust your settings up here and make sure scene lights and scene world are both on. This is starting to get really awesome. Having a camera also means we can play around with the focal length, which gives us drastically different looks. Sometimes it does happen that you'll get this effect where the geometry starts cutting off through the camera. This usually means that you have to adjust your clipping distance a tiny bit. Okay, we have spent some time adjusting our cameras and our lights a tiny bit. And I think now is a good time to get in some of that last detail. The kit comes with all these smaller detailed assets like cargo and some kinds of storage. And it also has this little truck that can help give some action to the scene. Okay, I think I'm about happy with my shot and my setup now, and I think I'm ready to get out a final shot. To actually render out a final image, I think we can adjust the render settings a bit. Firstly, let's adjust the samples and the denoise. Higher samples means higher quality, but also means longer render times. But this is where the denoiser can be really effectful. I found that something like 128 samples and with denoiser turned on gives me quite good results. Then we could also adjust the actual output format of our image. You could do something like a wide cinemascope or something like a square format for social media. And to actually get your render out, you can simply hit F12 and the render will start. Nice, looks awesome. But if you ever wanted to switch out the background with something else, then it would be nice to have that separated. Luckily, there is a really nice feature down here in the render settings under film called transparent. When we turn that on and render, we get it without the background. Awesome. Okay, let's save out the image as a PNG and then we can bring it all into something like Photoshop where we can give it those final adjustments. In Photoshop, we can bring in a different background, add some smoke and dust, adjust the colors or add special effects like these ship boosters. To aid your process in Photoshop, you can always log into some of the more advanced options like using render passes from Blender. They are a great way to give you some selections and quick masks. I can especially recommend the mist pass. It can really help create a sense of atmosphere. And it's a really big part of getting scale looking right. And here we have the final image. And I think it all turned out pretty cool in the end. Well, that's pretty much it for this tutorial. Hope you learned something and thanks for watching.